Hello, my name is Steve D'Agostino, and my co-host Anne Fernald and I welcome you to the Twice Over podcast, because to teach is to learn twice over. In this episode, Tactile Learning, we are joined by Louis Dean Valencia, an Associate Professor of Digital History and Coordinator of the Center for Public History at Texas State University, who shares his thoughts about encouraging students to learn through collaboration, curation, and creation. I am so excited today to be talking to my friend and colleague, Louis Dean Valencia, who is our first Fordham alumni guest. Louis got his PhD in history at Fordham in 2016, and that's how I know Louis from his time at Fordham, but he's currently an assistant professor at Texas State University. Louis is the author of Anti-Authoritarianism, and Youth Culture in Francoist Spain. And he's also edited a collection on far-right revisionism and the end of history. There's a lot to talk about in terms of politics and history. I've been following you on Twitter for years and every, almost every day it seems you tweet, I never thought my research would be quite this relevant and it keeps getting more and more and more relevant. So I hope we can talk about that. But really the reason that I thought that it would be great to talk with you is that I remember so vividly when we were talking years ago about a composition and rhetoric class you were teaching where you wanted students to have the feeling of what the public sphere was. And you had them sit in coffee shops and eavesdrop on people and then make a newspaper, like make a physical newspaper and make like a broadside based on what they overheard. And I was reminded of that recently because you tweeted out, like, I think all historians and literature professors should have their students learn some manual skill. I don't remember what you listed, but it was like shoemaking, bread baking, and printmaking or something like that. And I'm just, I would love to hear a little bit about what you see as the value of learning these I'm going to say almost archaic crafts are what their place is in the college classroom and why you think that's cool for students to do. Whenever I was a student, oftentimes everything was just becoming more and more digital. It just became sort of this thing where all the things that I was doing were digital. And I kind of had a kind of easy job at it, I think. Um, I'm actually in a digital history position right now. So I teach digital stuff all the time. But I remember I was at Fordham um, at the time and I was really interested in book binding. Just how, how does this work? How did somebody put together a book? Um, it was probably my second year of grad school. And I applied for this fellowship from the Spanish government, brought to, um, to campus a book binder, somebody who did book binding ecologically. And we brought together um, probably a group of maybe 20 students, mostly undergraduates, who were just there to kind of learn how to bind books. And it was basically just me trying to figure out like, what was the material culture of some of the stuff that I was studying specifically, but also how do you appreciate the amount of work that artisans put into their labor? And I think that one of the the benefits of that archaic endeavor is it's really a different way of understanding material culture. Whenever it's so easy just to go to, to go to the Strand, buy your book, at one point you would buy the paper, you might take that paper to a book binder who would then have to sew it together, maybe it was custom made um, to match some of your other books, and it was really an expensive process, right? And so trying to have students think about sort of the value of this information age that we're living in now, I thought thinking about sort of what did it take to get there? Thinking about newspapers, thinking about just the materials work that goes into spreading information, teaching, all those uh, things. So there's something about how hard it is to get the information that helps us understand the value of the information. Can yeah. you say a little bit more about how you think about that in your teaching? I think for me, it's a question of book history. So uh, I always tell people my position's in digital history, but I think of it as just an extension of book history. 
So what we now have done somehow is we've went from scrolls to codex back to scrolling um, in our everyday life. And so we've kind of gone back to an older form of really using information. And so that's kind of what I've been thinking a lot about. I was just reading the other day about the invention of the index and the index was invented post codex, right? Because you don't ever ask someone in a scroll, like, you know, open the scroll about 40 inches and you'll find the first <laughs> mention of, you, know, right. Right? you have to have a codex book to have an index, but indices are really tricky in, in, on a web page. Right. And we have hyperlinks now, which sort of work as like shortcuts to indices um, in some ways as well, or to a whole other text, which I guess to appreciate how these things are functioning, I think it's really helpful to be able to think about how you move through new types of technology and what it took to even get there in the first place. The uh, assignment that I've, I still do in my classes um, with the newspapers. Oh, you do? I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People look at me like I'm crazy. I'm like walking around a college campus with like boxes of glue sticks and scissors and people think, what is he doing? But in a lot of ways for me, I think it helps students to see how difficult it was to get information in the first place. It's not one of those things that I think students always, uh, even, well, even academics always understand how hard it is or it was whenever we were starting to create sort of these newspapers or indices, all of the things took time, but also they were very just dynamic um, for their time as well. So like imagine sending somebody to coffee shops that were specialized in the sciences and you go in and there's um, Sir Isaac Newton dissecting a dolphin on, in the middle of the coffee shop. You're gonna report that and people are gonna find that to be fascinating. And it, that'll be a hit for the next day whenever you're trying to sell your newspapers to other people in other coffee shops and you see how sort of information flows. Um, and that's one of the ways that I guess I kind of think a little bit about this is whenever you see uh, information tied to humans moving through spaces, it really changes sort of the, the dynamic and appreciation I think you have for knowledge generally. What I remember is that you were teaching students about the kind of structural transformation of the public sphere, this thing that Jürgen Habermas describes. And he describes the history of the newspaper as emerging out of reports from coffee shops. So why is it important for students in a, in a writing class or in a college class to understand that history in a material way and can you just tell us like what the assignment is just like if, if I wanted to do it if I'm listening to you and I'm like well that sounds kind of cool I'd like my students to do it can you kind of walk us through from a to z what the project is essentially what it what it is it's um, having first some lesson that we do go through a little bit of uh, Habermas's work we talk about sort of the history of books but in particular, the thing that I want them to understand is that this concept of the Enlightenment wasn't just a bunch of really old French dudes who were hanging out in coffee shops, which I think is the number one sort of thing that most people say or think of whenever I say the Enlightenment. It was coffee shops at the time where, where we first get these first newspapers. And so one of the things that I want them to think about is the coffee shop as a space where people were going where... They weren't getting drunk. They were getting a drug, caffeine, right? But it was a different type of sort of intellectual endeavor. So if somebody were going to a tavern, the intellectual conversation might eventually stagnate a little bit. But if you're at the coffee shop, which um, were sort of known as these like places where for a penny of the price of a cup of coffee, you could get a whole education for the day, learning about whatever theme each coffee shop had. So many of the coffee shops um, were themed around maybe theater or they were themed around science or they were uh, themed around some sort of issue that's contemporary. Some of them were themed around finance, right? And so people would go to these coffee shops with the purpose of learning about X topic or participating in that community. And this was 
all outside of a university sphere. And because of this sort of um, grouping of people that were showing up in coffee shops, um, both in, the, uh, in Great Britain and also in uh, France, people were interested to know, well, what's happening in the other coffee shops that I'm not going to? And so you would have these reporters who would go coffee shop to coffee shop, uh, just writing down basically uh, paragraph length reports of something that they've heard in a coffee shop that day. And those are all sort of combined at the printer's, um, the printer's uh, space where they put together the reports from these different coffee shops. And that's how you get the first newspapers is reports coming in from newspapers. It might be somebody coming in the coffee shop that said, I just got back from a trip from blah, blah, blah and heard this and saw this. And so the reporter would hear the news from the coffee shop and they would go back and they would publish it all in one broad sheet that was oftentimes thematic, not always, sometimes it was just a sort of catch all, but oftentimes the newspapers were thematic. And so one of the things that I wanted for students to be able to appreciate knowledge, this enlightenment was that people went to coffee shops to interact with other people, right? These philosophical ideas didn't just come from uh, sort of these great men in quotes, big scary quotes, but rather was part of a dialogue amongst people who were entering coffee shops. Um, one of the most famous uh, London coffee shops was owned by this woman named Molly, who was known as sort of being just a fantastic person to converse with. And it was described that she was holding court. And oftentimes this would be mixed with some of the images of her coffee shop. There's some paintings and uh, woodcut prints that survived where uh, there's women in the background, there's men that are there, but it's a really dynamic sort of uh, social space. And as soon as you can start to think about social spaces of the enlightenment as being more complicated than just Rousseau hanging out, which I, I love my Rousseau, don't get me wrong, but it makes it more interesting. And so what I have students do is uh, I send them uh, into coffee shops and they listen to conversations. And so, they'll sit and listen to maybe somebody talk about the, they could be talking about Ukraine, for example, today. They could be talking about a professor or something that they heard, they learned in class. It could be any number of things that they overhear in coffee shops. And then what they're supposed to do is they, we have a blog. So they publish their sort of report to the blog. And what I do is try to ask them to try to make sure that they have um, paragraphs, forms. So in the way that they would have in the Enlightenment that were short reports, not just long writing that we typically think of in an essay, but meant to be kind of like tweets in a lot of ways. It's um, very short form paragraphs. And so they publish these to the blog. And what I do is I then, um, I usually buy like some newsprint, some blank newsprint, um, which is super, super cheap to find. Um, and I print off all of their reports uh, on newsprint. And then what we do is um, over time, um, I come to class bringing with, once everything's collected and published um, and give them their stories. And what they have to do is act as editors. So in the period of an hour, essentially, I tell them you have to figure out like what you've read, what your colleagues have uh, uh, reported and you have to pull out a theme from all of these reports. And so they have to, um, maybe they're interested in race and suddenly out of the 20 students who are there, 10 of them have reported something about race issues and they're able to think, okay, well, we're gonna cut out, literally cut out the stories. Um, I have these stamps where they can um, stamp out uh, in the title of their newspaper. They put in all this sort of, um, Maybe if they, some of them are artists, sometimes somebody will try to sketch out an image that accompanies it. And at the end of it, they have a handmade sheet of paper that is newsprint that would at least be something similar to what the process would be like to put together a newspaper if you were doing it hundreds of years ago. And it has to fit a certain size and it has to be it has thematic. To, it has to be thematic. They have to think about where it is on the page, right? Who gets to have the top? 
top of the fold, bottom of the fold. What do students, that's a lot of work. It is. Right? It's a lot. And it's also a lot of time doing work that a skeptical colleague might say is kind of kindergarten work, you know, cutting pieces of paper and gluing them on. Like, isn't this a college classroom? So what do you say to people who say like, you know, shouldn't they be working on, you know, revising their prose? Why are they spending time with glue sticks and scissors? I think part of sort of the way I like to think about it, it's editing is a fundamental part of how and we how we write, how we think about things. And essentially what they're doing is editing each other's work. They're getting exposure to sort of how to create and think categorically. It's, it's honestly, I think a, a way of thinking about writing that brings in an audience that I, I think like there are classes that do exactly what you're describing, right? There will always be professors who teach different ways and that's great. They can do their thing, but you can have different types of experiences also and still be learning important skills for writing, for reading, for thinking about how to think about audience. I know one of my newest pet peeves is whenever the student only thinks they're writing for a professor. Right. I, I think the quality of the work isn't as good when writing for the professor as it would be writing for your peers and a broader audience. This brings that right into the classroom, right? They're talking with each other, they're they're collaborating and they're deciding, you know, your story is great, but it's not on our theme. Right. And it makes um, for interesting discussions. And it also has um, a real way of bringing in social issues into the class that feels more organic, um, for me at least. It's these are the things that our people are talking about in the in the world. Oh, that's interesting. I like that. Right. So they have to have overheard it. Right. To make the newspaper. Exactly. So it has to be an issue that somebody cared enough about to talk about. Do you ever have problems with people not overhearing anything interesting? Never. (laughs) That's never been a problem. So I want to just go back briefly and to your thought about the value of having students make objects. Why do you think that's valuable? I would say that there's a way of learning that, and there's um, studies to back me up on this, that tactile learning is one of the better ways for somebody to learn just about anything, to be frank. Using your hands, thinking about how to integrate sort of material culture rather than just sort of rote memorization. This isn't, um, I guess, making exercise, but one thing I often t- will do is um, when teaching the Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen, one thing I always like to do is try to teach students that it wasn't just a list of things, like one after another, an article, article, article. These things were meant to be thought of as a holistic net or web of rights that you're supposed to have and they're supposed to function together. And so one thing that I often do is I'll have students um, have the original translate, uh, original sort of document, then they have to translate the article into something that seems more of their voice. So something that's more understandable. And then we, uh, I, I should send you photos, but we get in the class and everybody has their article and they have a bowl of yarn. And they have to figure out how their article connects to another article within the document. And it shows sort of these things as not just being list of your rights, but rather a whole sort of program where these rights are supposed to be functioning together in some way. And using that material way, students see it and they, they're actually jumping between each other and trying to tie together their ideas um, through these articles. It helps people, I think, to be able to process very complex ideas in a way that all you're doing is moving categories around with your hands. You're trying to figure out how is this constructed? How is this 
related to something else that I'm trying to get out there? How do I communicate it better? I've also done a variation of this in the composition and rhetoric class actually at Fordham where students made, uh, I themed the whole class around hipster and sort of subcultures and students had to create fanzines at the end of the semester. They were editing each other's work, giving each other feedback. And at the end of the semester, they had sort of a, a thing that they could talk about, right? These are the things that we studied and learned about. These are ideas that other people brought to the table and they learned how to write for an audience. And it's great for the sort of 300 word formula that a lot of that type of writing does is if you're writing a fanzine, making a fanzine, students learn about like punk culture. Some of them have never used a Xerox machine in that way before in their lives. It's a lot of different types of things that I think that they learn from it. Do you think there's a vibe shift coming? Are you a trend forecaster? I know you're a historian, but you study youth culture. What do you think about those moments? What, where do you think we are right now with that? I think we are in a, a really fortuitously artistic moment where people have been at home baking bread and learning guitar and making their little crafts. And at the end of something like that, you come out with a couple of skills sometimes and maybe a couple of insights into yourself and the world that you're ready to share. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was, I was in Washington Square Park and there was this just great band playing in front of the fountain where they were, it was a nice mix of like punk, ska, but also with like this jazzy element to it. And it was just one of those things where I thought in that moment, like there's a, a new um, aesthetic, new sound that's really coming out of uh, this. Uh, one thing that I've uh, noticed, for example, is just the shift in aesthetic. If you look at TikTok, for example, um, I don't know if everybody does, but I spend a lot of time on TikTok. Yeah, so do I, I love it. It's great. If you see like a lot of, they'll be in a dark room, LED lights in the background, and it's very sort of, um, it looks like a, it would have been in a like 1980s movie about the future in some ways. Mm. But that aesthetic is now becoming kind of a very real thing. Whereas I think 10 years ago, the aesthetic was more kind of this wannabe 1930s, 40s, bar room, hipster, uh, mustachioed belonging uh, person from the 30s or 40s and now we're suddenly having people thinking about well is this the future I think and I think that's kind of where we are is recreating aesthetic. Um, it's so interesting to me that you talk about TikTok because as I'm listening to you talk about craft one of the things that I love on TikTok is all the people who explain how they do things that are incredibly laborious. And you have this combination of the newest technology, right? It's incredibly kind of amazing that we can use our phones to make stop action or multi-cut videos that look super professional. And you can watch a three minute video of someone from start to finish, like picking out the fabric and making a finished couture outfit and explaining to you, like, this is the thing that's tricky about zippers. Here's where I decided to add an, an embellishment. I just find it totally riveting. I know that people talk about this high tech, high touch gap, right? That the more digital we become, the more we yearn for artisanal things, right? That as the world seems to flatten out into like, here we are talking, the three of us on Zoom, we're all in different places, but we're talking about, you know, crochet and bread baking and shoemaking. So I'm wondering what you think about that interesting combination of new technology like TikTok as a place to share artisanal work. Oh, absolutely. And even the act of editing videos is sort of a act of creation, right? And so it's almost a uh, meta layer there. It's both you're creating the video that is 
splicing together these things, which is one skill of filmmaking, essentially, with these uh, very specific, sometimes niche ways of producing dresses or cardigans. Uh, one of my favorite things over the summer of 2020 was the trend of making this sort of patchwork cardigan that was inspired by Harry Styles. Um, That's right, the granny square cardigan. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. And it was so um, famous, um, or it was such a thing that the actual maker of the cardigan, which was supposed to just be a one-off for Harry Styles, is like a special thing, released instructions on how to make it. And so people were able to do it themselves. And so it became this, it moved from being couture fashion to being the thing that you can feasibly do yourself, which is a totally different type of way of thinking about these things. Really interesting that, okay, so we're feeling this kind of sense of disconnection because we live in an increasingly digital culture. So we're disconnected from our embodiment in some real meaningful ways. Then we're beset by a virus that one of the major threats is that robs you of one of your senses. Mm. So we all go into isolation. And when we're in isolation, we reconnect with sensual experiences, right? We bake, we knit, we create, we make music. It's almost, you know, too neat when you think of it in those terms, that theme of, you know, disconnection and embodiment. I think that's the thing that a lot of people are yearning for right now, more than anything. So I'm teaching this class decolonizing and queering European history this semester. I know that's a whole other thing. But I asked them about a week or, ago or so if they felt anxiety when they talked to people in groups and everybody's hands shot up instantly. They all were just expressing that they have deep anxiety when talking to people. Yeah. Which to me was very sort of indicative of maybe lack of practice in the the in those skills in the last couple of years and so we're it's, rusty we're rusty and that's okay I thought it was great that they were they felt comfortable enough to share that I wonder if there's anything that you were hoping we could talk about that we didn't get to talk about how people are connected to each other through physical spaces how are people able to think of their their own stories as and narrate their own stories as connected to other people. And I think those are the things that really will help move classrooms, not to the, I hate the idea of like the new normal or, but hopefully to better spaces, uh, to be able to think about sort of, we are part of each other's stories and really try to think about sort of narratives and histories as uh, interconnected, not just sort of background characters, but uh, maybe a supporting cast. We are part of each other's stories. Exactly. We don't all have to bring main character energy to every encounter. We can right. occasionally be uh, supporting players, best friends, exactly. background bit players, right? Exactly. I love it. I just I want a really it. memorable cameo. That's all I like. <laughs> You know, I, I, I've said something similar to that, to that before, too, where I just am thinking to myself, you know, I just want, like, sometimes a friend who just, like, is a special guest star for the day, and they're the, they're the star, it's great, you get to learn something, do something, and it's fantastic. Oh, the last question I always ask our guests is to tell us the story of a teacher who's been really important in your life. Oh, wow. That's impossible to choose because you were one of my teachers. So that's, I, I would say I couldn't choose one. I think, so my, it's kind of a sad story maybe. I don't know. Okay. But um, my high school English teacher, she was a Black woman who had her PhD. She was not able to find a job at a university. 
she spoke about it maybe once or twice and she was just a fantastic English teacher. Um, I never thought that I would like George Eliot, but then I ended up loving George Eliot because of her. She was also a black belt in karate. She had come from Ghana and had been in the US about 10 years, I think. And so she was always commenting on sort of things that she noticed that Americans do that she had not seen elsewhere in the world. So I think it was probably her, I would say as one of the more influential teachers that one just got me thinking about sort of literature that I didn't and works and lives that I would not have necessarily thought of as interesting beforehand and so I think that sort of real ability to build and teach empathy through what you read is a real real talent Louis, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. You're our first Fordham Graduate School alumni guest. And it's really such an honor to know you and such an inspiration to hear about what you do with your students. Really, truly, I'm so glad to have you as a, as a friend and colleague. It's just, it's always great to talk with you. Thank you for having me. This is awesome. Twice Over Podcast is available on SoundCloud, Stitcher, and Spotify, with new episodes appearing twice each week. For host and guest bios and show notes, please visit our website, twiceoverpodcast.com. You can follow us on Twitter at twiceover1 or email us at twiceoverpodcast at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening.